next person that's going to speak is Lee Humber, and he's in your pack here. So I won't read it all out. I'll read some of it. He's a learning disability academic and activist, and he's worked with people with learning difficulties for 30 years in schools, colleges, and community settings. And he's now going to. Where is he going to sit? <laughs> I thought he was. I thought he was going to swap with me. I think he's just setting up his PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so Lee's going to come here in a minute. Thank you. I was invited to another conference in, in London and they asked me to do a history of learning, history of learning disability in 10 minutes, which was interesting. Uh, this week I've got six minutes, which is a challenge. Uh, so I've got to get on with it. Um, so three very brief slides. That one. Uh, that's kind of, if you like, an opening statement, I suppose. The language of learning disability has evolved as part of a broader discourse which seeks to explain social disadvantage and by implication advantage in terms of inherent genetically encoded abilities. Beneath the language is a political struggle stretching back to the end of the 19th century over who is responsible for poverty and intellectual underdevelopment, the individual or society. In other words, what I'm trying to say there is that language is rooted in the types of societies that we live in. And the language of learning disability, I think, I think illustrates this fantastically well. If you think about the language, so today we've got learning difficulty or learning disability, previous to that we had mental handicap, before that we had backward, dull, feeble-minded, mental deficiency, imbecile, idiot. So that, that stretches, that, that, that root back in the language takes us to the roots of the language of learning disability, which is very much <coughs> at the turn of the 19th century, the early 20th century, and the period of eugenics. <coughs> And let's not uh, um, uh, uh, kill ourselves with the language of learning disability. And the very concept, the modern concept of learning disability is rooted in that eugenics movement that swept across, uh, we invented it by the way, a guy called Francis Galton, swept across the UK, uh, uh, parts of Europe and America, and obviously most famously was applied in uh, Nazi Germany, came to its sort of, if you like, logical conclusion of eugenics of this idea that we could breed out of existence the so-called uh, lesser uh, able, the so-called less worthwhile human beings. And that came to, uh, uh, as I say, comes to its logical conclusion in a habit that was agreed by the, the Nazis. That, that's the power of eugenics, really. Eugenics does two things. First of all, it locates in the individual problems of society. So it blames the individual for living in poverty. Blames the individual for not being able to have a job. Blames them in terms of not being intellectually able enough or not being intellectually able enough to hold down a permanent job. So it blames the individual. The second great strength of eugenics is it sweeps out from this focus on the individual right across society. So we see that in what, what happened in, in Nazi Germany, but we also see in uh, what happened, not as, not as uh, dramatically as that, but uh, uh, we also see that in the UK. People might be familiar with something <coughs> called uh, the 11 plus. Oh, do, do, do people know what the 11 plus is? The 11 yeah, plus yeah. is it's an IQ test, the 11 plus. It's, it's 11 because a genius called Spearman in 1902 said that, well, at the age of 10, everybody's schools stopped growing. So after 10, obviously, because your school doesn't get any bigger, uh, you can't get any more intelligent. And on that was based the ideas of an Plus, a man called Cyril Burt, who was actually an extremely powerful man, first chair of the British Psychological Society. He uh, developed the 11 Plus test, 1938, something called the Spence Committee. Cyril Burt was uh, behind that. That turned into the 1944 Education Act, in which was enshrined. 11 plus. By the way, in, in the 1960s, all of Cyril Burke's work was found to be fraudulent. He oh. made it all up. The 11 plus grammar schools, uh, are we familiar with grammar schools? Yes. Yes, this is something that somebody called Theresa May is in the process of trying to reintroduce on the basis of this 
corrupt, fraudulent um, uh, um, science. Okay, so, so that's the language of their disability, if you like. It's rooted in the societies that we live in, and it's, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's got very dark roots in those backwaters of, of eugenics. The last point I want to make, because I must be up to be six minutes by now, uh, but the last point I want to make is how this, how this language changes. And again, that's really interesting in terms of the language of learning disability. Because we've got learning disability today, but also we've got learning difficulty today because of that history of resistance. People challenging the terms by which they were described. Firstly, after the Second World War, it was parents who came to the organising something we also might know, the organisation called MENCAP, but then many other organisations also. But parents got together, organised, tried to uh, uh, change the way that their children and offspring were described. But then, much more recently, from the 1980s on, on into the 1990s, people with learning disabilities themselves became organised. And that's when we got things like uh, uh, the People First movement, incredibly powerful, during the 1980s and 1990s. I gather that you've been down to the House of Parliament today. In the 1990s, people with learning disabilities also went down to the House of Parliament on demonstrations and broke in and occupied the place. And that, that came uh, uh, some years later, the Disability Discrimination Act, not perfectly legislated by any means, but a, sign a, a signifier of change. So it's in that act of resistance that we challenge language and change the terms in which we are, uh, we are understood. And that's why, and here I'll, just, I'll finish on this in a, in a quick plug. Uh, I'm from Ruskin uh, College. And after organising, I was at Liverpool College last year, uh, Liverpool University last year, uh, and uh, we uh, organised a very successful early disability conference made up of service providers, academics, people with learning disabilities, all of whom contributed fantastic well to a really successful conference. This next year, we're trying to put on a, a People First conference up at Ruskin. If we can get to, if we can somehow get together two thousand pounds, then we'll pay for the, the People First uh, 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 conference next year, and that will be the first first People First conference this century. First for about twenty years, and if we're able to do that, we'll start pulling together uh, uh, those, uh, uh, those that power that people with learning disabilities have in some kind of organisational way, express it organisationally, and we can start to challenge. And people will be aware that the terrible uh, cutbacks and terrible sort of conditions that people with learning disabilities are increasingly living in because of, uh, uh, as a result of this uh, uh, disgraceful period of austerity that we're living in. So that's, that, that's my last point. If we're going to change the terms in which we're, uh, uh, with which we're described, then we need to change the social conditions that set the framework for those terms. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much.